Really? <laughs> when did you start? <laughs> I did call and tell you to come, and I was very firm about this, so uh, yes, you thank you, Patty, I, I appreciate that. You just wanted me to give you a hard time. It, the week is not complete if Patty doesn't give me a hard time, so I, I feel like, you know... I haven't called him for a week, he goes, he calls me, are you okay? <laughs> well, I wanted to make sure, I just, you know, kind of, it's a little weird. I was watching TV and eating chicken eaters. Oh, I love chicken eaters. She likes her chicken. I wonder why. Are you recording this? I was, yes. Jane, who's going to be watching at home, we, we're remembering you as someone who loves chicken gizzards. She gets, when I talk to her about someone loving chicken gizzards, she actually starts to turn green. It, it's really funny. So, uh, all right. I'm going to send her something. No. <laughs> all right. Fry them in butter? Yep. We are changing the topic from chicken gizzards. <laughs> all right. Um. By the way, good to see you all this morning. Today's service, though, is about um, moving on from sad moments. I want to talk about what we do when something happens in our lives and it makes us sad. And sometimes it's natural for us to get some time alone to kind of... But then, how do we move on, do something more productive, or just... What do we even call moving on from sad moments? There's a really neat moment um, where Jesus... Um, loses someone very close to him. And I want to talk about his reaction and what he does to that. So, uh, good to see you all. And of course, I'll be asking your opinions. How do we kind of move on from sad moments? And what does it really even mean to move on from that? All right. So, let's see. I'm going to start off with a song. Uh, some of you know this well, so sing it out big and proud. And others will pick up on it real quick. Up the top, kids. Oh, soon and very soon. Jingles. That's 
with Kitty Cat's Jingles, Quinn's the new dog. Okay. And then she has two geckos. <laughs> I don't know what the geckos' names are. Fair enough. But she posted that her pen uh, her animals make her happy. Good to hear. Good to so hear. So happy is good. Happy is good. Because for many of the readers that you're going to be reading, there was only one translation. 
there was only one English version that had any merit, and that would be the King James Version. And quite funny, uh, an African-American gentleman in the back, without missing a beat, said, that's the Bible Jesus used, which obviously <laughs> is pretty hilarious because there was, the, yeah, but, um, so, translations. Um, there's obviously, um, King James becomes the translation for English speakers um, at the end of a very long uh, question about an English translation of the Bible that starts with King Henry VIII, goes through the entire reign of Queen Elizabeth I, and ends up at King James. Um, so, I personally use much more modern translations in church, but what is your opinion on translations? Is it all the same? Is there a real difference? Is there a thing going on? Do we have favorite translations? I'm just kind of curious. Obviously, the joke here was that her, you know, paternal figure, you know, in the other words, the black mom in this case, wasn't trusting anything that wasn't a King James version, which is a joke in some fact. Yeah, go for it. Well, the experience that I've had with uh, translations is uh, we go to a church and we would go to Bible study, and we read verses out of the Bible and. Everybody, not everybody, but most of the people would come up with translations of what it meant. Mm -hmm. And I would look to read it, read it, read it. I didn't get that out of it. Where would they get that from? And I didn't really understand. The Bible study didn't, with my own opinion, was different than when theirs was. And if I, I was afraid to say anything because they wouldn't agree with me. You know, that's what actually what they were trying to say in the Bible. And I, I was pretty confused about that. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to understand. Yeah, I mean, not only now that the, the million dollar question is if it is is was you, was it understanding like um, the actual thing going on, or did you have a translation that was like, hey, what are they talking about? Yeah, there's stuff in the King James. That, um, I didn't, I didn't. Where did they get that from? That's what it means. I don't. I didn't get that at all. I, I was just lost. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it, ha it happens often. Sometimes it is just a translation thing. I mean. We got so wrapped up in the King James Version that was to find the authority of it. But now the modern English reader often has a great deal of trouble with it. It has words and break. It, it's not completely analogous, but it's kind of like who here had to read Shakespeare in uh, English class somewhere along the line. Yeah, and I mean, there's a little bit of a, it can be beautiful, it can be wonderful, but there's the modern English reader always going to take a minute or two reading it and be like, what was that? Uh, especially so, Revelations, it's when we talk about Revelations, I mean, they, the meanings that they come up with, you know, what this meant and what that meant and what he's trying to say. And yeah. I just didn't under, I, I was lost. I mean, well, you're not alone, by the way. I mean, the problem is even in the perfect translation of Revelation, it's confusing. The, the imagery, it's fundamentally... It's a fundamentally confusing book, and a, the problem is a lot of people say they think they know exactly what it means, but it's really, it, it, it's, what do you want to say, poetic and vague and has all these images and metaphors that are confusing, yeah. and so it, it, a lot of you are like, oh no, I, I know exactly what it means and tell me all about it, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason why I don't preach from that a whole lot, because honestly, there's a lot of things in there, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So. You're not alone, Dave. That's all I can say about that one. Anyway, in our church, I love the CEV version, a contemporary English version. It is, uh, um, it does well to the extent that it uh, makes simple things that other Bibles make complicated. I like that. Uh, sometimes it falls a little flat on beautiful metaphors and stuff that tries to explain it. So when that happens, I jump to the NRSV uh, when I grew up with. Uh, but uh, all right, any other? So for this poor woman talking to the. Uh, well, it's really hard, but talking to Grandma there. Uh, any other great opinions on translations? Very interesting, and I, I want to relate. Uh, I want to ask you about this because for a long time, the the whole thing was, um, and this came out from the Protestant Reformation. For the whole t long time, God's language was kind of like Latin, the Latin Church, and so the Vulgate, the Latin translation, was the thing. Uh, what was your experience with all that? Did you remember Latin masses? Of course, yeah. I liked him. Tell me more about it, please, because I never experienced one, so I'm kind of curious. Um, uh, no, you've never experienced I have one. never sat through a Latin Mass, ever, under any context, so I'm always curious about people who have. Well, I, I liked it because I, it was the, the Latin Mass um, was more poetic. It's mm -hmm. not feeling. 
you know, like echo spirit to to walk mm -hmm. and stuff, instead of it with your spirit. Yeah. It, it, it just has a rhythm that yeah. English doesn't have. Fair enough, yeah. I mean, so did you like it even though, I mean, I assume you didn't, how good is your Latin? Well, nobody speaks it. Yeah. <laughs> you are. Did, did you understand it during the mass? Yes. You know, all of it? Yes. Well, it would always have the translations, but okay. we always have the translations there. But pretty soon I didn't need them, and I took Latin in high school, and um, and it's also a good thing to know when you go into any kind of medical field, mm -hmm. and so it's always been helpful. You I, don't forget it then. No. When you keep using it. Well, no. When I, I once met a gentleman. This is kind of an interesting. So he once turned me. He was a Catholic gentleman, and he's an older guy. I was working with him actually restoring a church. And when he goes, you know what? I miss the Latin mass. Like, really? You know Latin? No, not a word of it. I'm like, so you went to church, went through a whole service, didn't understand a word of it, and now you miss that. Yep. And for some reason, the words he heard over and over again became sacred, though he couldn't tell you what any one of them meant. Yeah, yeah, that's it. There's a, uh, it's, it's also, it's ritualistic and, yep. and more mm -hmm. sacred sounding, and it has just a lot of weight. Fair enough. No, I've been fascinated with this because ever since I met that gentleman, I just thought, I, I just, in other words, to, to really love a service, even if you didn't understand what a word of it meant, just the sound of the sacred nature. I found it fascinating. I thought I'd share it with you. And thank you. thanks, Ken. It's Appreciate like it. listening to the chants that were the Gregorian chants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's the rhythm and the musicality. They make it very, mm -hmm. si yeah, even though didn't understand a word. Yeah, I guess, I guess for me it was just such a foreign thing. For me, church is all about conversing about things in our faith. And so the idea of going into a service, hearing the whole thing in a language you can't possibly understand, that no one speaks anymore, and, well, I guess you could understand it, but you, without, and, and, and finding a real enjoyment in that. I just find, I mean, maybe it's just because it's so different than the way I was raised. I think it's very connected to speaking in tongues. In that you don't understand it, but you feel something with it. More emotion than more, sense. more, yeah, more, more yeah. emotion than content. Yeah, I, I would argue uh, speaking in tongues feels much more chaotic. That yeah, there is a regular rhythm to, um, and all, um, the, very interesting. I once did a uh, communion service um, when I, um, at a retirement home, but, and there was uh, it was a wing that was you know, very mental stuff going on, dementia and things like that. But it's funny you'd say, you know, uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. So people, people who could not tell me their name would say that <laughs> at that moment. And it, there's something about that that's amazing. And much more in speaking in tongues. Very same thing, ritualistic, and it gets into the... There's some interesting moments with that, by the way. I once visited somebody in the church that uh, had horrible um, dementia and all, actually Alzheimer's. And couldn't remember names and all that. But he could sing Jesus Loves Me. Like you brought him to church one day, and you just sang right along with that, and it was just some things just stick like that, you know. Yeah, we think it did. I felt too in this when I was in this Bible study group that the people that were in there were like professors and teachers and you know, all like that, and I felt belittled by them because I thought, well, they're really smart. They got that out of that. Where they get? I didn't see that. You know? <laughs> it was very intimidating sometimes. I felt. Like, I didn't want to, you know, be yeah. there because I don't understand what they're talking about. You know? yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a... I, for me, and this is my own bias, I think a translation of the Bible should be as understandable as possible to interact with it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been different, you know, that's why I'm particularly fond of the CEV because I think it's a very uh, grounded, down-to-earth, anybody could pick it up and understand the basics. But that's my bias on that one. And honestly, I'd like to be able to discuss... Uh, Bible stuff with people who aren't educated in it and really don't know much of anything about it and just kind of delve into. Which is why today I'm going to talk to you about something we've all experienced. And I'm going to look at a Bible story and ask how Jesus dealt with it. And then I'm going to ask how you deal with it. Because we all have moments where we get sad. We need a moment to ourselves or however we deal with sadness. And then we decide at what moment do we kind of go back to forgive the horrible word normal. 
And so, and I'm not talking about that. How do we go from one to the other on that? All right, have I, have I anything else on translations? Full list. Uh, what's next, my dear? Time with children. Oh, Rylan, I just don't know what to share with you. Is there a pause button on that? See, so join me up here. I want to show you something. Ryland, you seem pretty smart, so I want I want to share something with you, and I want you to yeah, let's have a seat right here. You are very smart. Have a seat here. We're gonna chat. We're gonna chat about something. I want you to tell me when I show you this picture. I want you to tell me everything you know about it, and we'll be talking about this. What is this thing? It's a sloth. Very good. See, I knew you were smart. This is excellent. Now I want you to tell me everything you know about the good old is it Amazonian? Are they Amazon? Yeah, the true sloth. Fire away. Slow. Slow. Very slow. He hangs on trees. Yep. Yeah. What is their primary diet, my dear? Is it, is it leaves? Leaves. More leaves than bugs. Because bugs fly around quickly. They're very slow. But today, I am using the sloth as a lesson because sometimes people like you and me, we move very quickly and our minds move quickly and we want something right now. But sometimes we need to learn patience. And so, to learn patience, we're going to look at the tree sloth. And for every minute of time you spend with him, you're going to move as slowly <laughs> as a tree sloth. And that is your challenge for the, You want to try it for a second? When you hold the, when you play the video game, you get a, you get a break, okay? But if you're holding the cloth for the rest of the day, you have to move as slowly as a. Pet 
tree sloth. Now they're actually pretty strong. So sometimes in the night he would escape his cage. As he said in the morning, he realized he escaped it. So they went looking for him. He would, they would run away. He'd never be more than 50 feet away by the time he caught him because they moved so slowly. <laughs> and they would just grab him, put him back, and you know, so he had a pet tree sloth going up as a kid. I thought that was kind of neat. All right. Thank 
had it chained and put in prison. And he did this because John had told him, It isn't right for you to take Herodotus, the wife of your brother Philip. So Herod wanted to kill John, but the people thought John was a prophet, and Herod was afraid of what they might do. So when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodotus danced for the guests, and she pleased Herod so much that he swore to give her, or give her whatever she wanted. But the girl's mother told her to say, You're on a platter. I want the head of John the Baptist. The king was sorry for what he had said, but he did not want to break the promise he had made in front of his guests. So he ordered a guard to go to the prison and cut off John's head. It was to be taken on a platter to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. John's followers took the body and buried it. And then they told Jesus about what had happened. And after Jesus heard about John, he crossed Lake Galilee to go to some place where he could be alone. But the crowds found out and followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus got out of the boat, he saw the large crowd. He felt sorry for them and healed anyone who was sick. Uh, I could talk to you for a long time about the story of uh, how John the Baptist uh, meets his end because uh, it's sort of a, a feminist uh, uh, feminist field day because it's, it's really horrible in the sense that Herod, the one who makes the decision to kill John the Baptist, is sort of, uh, it's not really his fault. It's all the women around him who connive him into doing it. It's a, it's a horrible thing. But I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that right now because there's something I really want to focus on. What really moves me in this story is Jesus' reaction. Um, too often, churches don't really talk enough about that relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. They talk about John the Baptist is the one who proclaimed that Jesus was coming. And that's all well and good, but I think there was a much closer relationship between them. I think, in many ways, John the Baptist was a teacher of Jesus, was um, a mentor, and Jesus truly loved and respected him. So Jesus, when he hears about John's death, needs to be alone. He wants to back away from everyone for a while. He's viscerally upset, and he wants to, uh, but he doesn't really have that luxury. He goes across Lake Galilee, up, trying to be alone, and by the time he gets there, people are there and they need him. And at some point, he, Jesus comes to the conclusion, or maybe he doesn't even have a choice, that he, doesn't, that he can't wallow in his sadness anymore. He's got stuff he needs to do. So my question for you today is, when do we move past a moment of sadness, that time when we're alone, or how do we deal with sadness, which is different for all of us, and then move on to, for lack of a better word, a better place. And I'd like to play with that all. What does it mean to move on? What does it mean to um, get past a hurt? Certainly we don't forget it, but what does it mean to move past it? And at what point do we say, like uh, Trisha Yearwood in the song, I want to live again? So, first things first. I'm going to, play with, I'm going to have a nice seat here, grab my coffee. See if I can see everyone so I can chat with you all. If some, a uh, big general question. So if news falls to you that's really sad and upsetting, how do you deal with it? Just to start from the very beginning. You get very bad news, something which is just really, really sad. How do you personally deal with it? What do you do to, at the moments like that? Well, I think, like Jesus did, I like to run away. Fair enough. I didn't want to make that assumption. Different people do different things. But I, I was thinking, because this is what I do, I was hoping, or not hoping, thinking possibly some people like to be alone after very bad news. So, do I have any others in, in the game that are kind of like that, where we need to be alone when we are? You got your Zora? Okay. Um, anyone else do something radically different when they get bad news? I have to keep busy so I don't think about it. Ah, so Cassie's a, a, a busy, but it was once a, a wonderful, uh, a, a interesting, uh, um, so once in a neat episode of a show called King of the Hill, which is an animated show, but, and it's usually just very funny stuff, but it had a really interesting moment once where Peggy, the mother of the family, um, when I think her uh, father passed away, um, she consumes herself with all the work around the funeral and the meals and all of that. 
and there's this amazing moment where everyone finally leaves, and she keeps trying to find things to do. And there's this big moment when the dishes are finally done and all this up, where it's very difficult for her to admit that there's nothing else to do, and now she has to deal with her feelings. Really, for a, for a, for a comedy show, it had a really serious moment to it. Nice. So we got some that go off alone, some who try to keep busy. What else do you do when you get really bad news? I need somebody to call me. Oh, so you're one of the. I, so if you have someone around, do you talk to them a lot about it, or are you more quiet at that moment? I probably don't talk about it. Fair enough. Yeah. I go over it and over it and over it in my head. And just sort of chat with that person yes. about Is that person's role now to put in their two cents, or are they just sort of listening and nodding their head? They're usually mostly listening. I, I go with, I listen to it. Oh, well, yeah, fair enough. And like with Robin, she told me that she's been telling me over and over and over. Yeah. So, but I listen for her because that that one has to her a whole lot more. But most of the time, I like to have somebody with me. Fair enough, fair enough. Patty, if I may ask a very direct question, so bad news, how do you deal with that? In other words, what do you do if, if you get bad news? Well, when I got the bad news about Tracy, yeah. I was by myself, so I just sat there and cried and wondered why it happened and then thought about it for a while. And then I had to vent to Jane, so we had an yep. hour talk. <laughs> and then um, we just decided that... Um, our way to deal with it was have the memorial at our house for Tracy. Hmm. And that helped a lot. I mean, it's still there. The pain is still there. It's something that I'll never get over with. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, um, you try to take each day at a time. Um, my depression was really bad, so they hmm. increased my antidepressants, and that helped me get through the situation and now with Dr. Quinn dying, that was my eye doctor, um, with six kids, it just, you know, you just wonder why, why things like that happen and then you've got 100 year old people in the nursing home that have no, have no life yep. and are planning to die and they're still here, so yep. I just question yep. what God's reasonings were, but then I know he works it all the best way he can. So I just take it day by day and try to move on. How do we then, and so we do some different things when we're faced with something <laughs> sad, but at what point, even though a certain sadness never really ends, at what point do we go back to the way things work? You never do. Oh, okay, yeah. It's always on your mind, and life will never go back the way it was. You just have to continue with what it is now. So for you, Patty, you kind of create a new normal in some ways. Yep. Janina, you look deep in thought there for a minute, and I want to I, capture I was, I was thinking about Jesus and where yeah. he was there. You know, it's, this had to be after his baptism because John baptized him. Correct. And um, like you said, weren't they cousins? Of, I forgot their. Tech, yeah, it, the tra again, translation. They, they get the translation issues. But uh, yeah, they're considered cousins. Um, technically, the word in Greek meant uh, strong relative. So we don't, yeah, it's a vague oh, term for know. close relative. But in the Gospel of Luke, but only the Gospel of Luke, they're considered relatives. And other, in other accounts, they're just very close. So it's hard to tell. Okay. Yes. Well, anyway, and so, and, and because. Jesus is God, and he knew what he was here for, and he knew what was really going to happen, ultimately. Mm -hmm. He was going to be sacrificed, too. Mm -hmm. And I think that that may be part of his sadness, is that things were progressing here, and it was going to be happening to him, too. Mm -hmm. This isn't one isolated incident, incident in his life that to return to normal. Or even a new normal. It was. It was as he knew it was going to be. 
That's a great question to bring up. Is Jesus' reaction that need to be alone, that need to separate, is that about things progressing towards his own death, or is he just missing John the Baptist? In other words, is he just missing his friend? And that's it. We'll never know the answer. I'm just sort of throwing it out there. Because my assumption is uh, that he simply, in a very human way, misses a mentor that was sad to hear of his death. Period. But I, your perspective is very well, interesting. Well, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that gets you bold. Yeah. But then you sit there and you're thinking, you go, oh, yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. I mean, he was in a common. very dangerous line of work anyway. Yeah, yeah. right. They, right, exactly. Yeah. Partners they were. Yeah. In this dangerous line. And so, Jesus doesn't have much of a luxury of determining, okay, I've had my time alone. I need to go back to something that's... I mean, immediately people need him. Have you ever been in an experience where um, you kind of would have preferred some moments alone, but someone needs you right here and now, and that's it? Tell me about it. Well, that's, that's just it. You know, when you're, well, like when you're a parent and you've got more than one child, something happens to one child and you just want to grieve, but you've got the other children. You I can't guess. just let them go too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of touched by this. Jesus really doesn't have the luxury of spending a whole lot of time alone. He's got that boat ride, but really, I mean, as soon as he gets there, people need him for this and that. Um, does it help or hurt if you don't have a lot of time to grieve? In other words, sometimes something bad happens because we'd like to be alone, and sometimes, certainly mothers out here, are just, yeah, so you just don't have that luxury. People need you right here and now. Does that help or hurt the whole thing? Helps. Helps me. Helps. Yeah. I would say it helps just because it keeps your, you, uh, you think about, okay, my parents are every day, every day I think of my parents, mm -hmm. and that's, I expect that to happen, and I, I know that, and you just have to get through that, mm -hmm. but I think the needing the people that, people need you, and you feel better just because you have to take care of things. Mm. And yeah, like when you took care of your other kids, that helped, didn't it? Well, yeah. You have to come back. Yeah, you can't wallow. Yeah. So you're both telling me that that ultimately is kind of a helpful thing as opposed to, because your natural instinct is to go and be alone. I've heard that from more than one person. But if you don't have that luxury, is that actually helping the process? I'm just kind of curious. Is it, you know? Well, at times, yeah. I'm sure there was times that, like at night after the kids are in bed, it's harder, wasn't it? To accept that when it's gone, you have to go on. But, and, and there's days, all at once, you just sit there and cry. Mm -hmm. I did that. My grandfather has a, was a blacksmith. Okay. And he welded a lot. And he had pure glasses that were all speckled from welding mm -hmm. things coming up. And oh, they, and he, yeah. Because yeah. they were glass glasses. And yeah. And all I had to do was look at those glasses and I started crying. Mm -hmm. And it had been years since he had gone. Yeah. But that was him. You saw him when I, when I saw the glasses. Mm -hmm. And I, you have that forever, that there's days like that. Mm -hmm. So you, I don't know that you ever really get over the grieving itself. Okay. To some degree you're going to grieve yeah. for a long time. Enough, fair enough. So there is no, and in some ways, so how do you know when you, there is no really moving on. You just kind of adjust and, yeah. I'm, I'm personally kind of terrified to be left alone with my grief and sad thoughts because I have a fear that if I let myself sink that low, I'll never get back out again, which is why I keep busy. I don't want to focus on myself at all. I just want to do something so I don't have to. 
because the fear is I'll never climb out of that pit if I let myself go in it. I'm kind of curious, uh, anybody else in the room um, use keeping busy as a, as a method for dealing with grief in general? Or is Cassie the only one that way? She's not the only one in the world. I'm, no. saying, I'm feeling the room out here. All right, so I would have liked to have uh, bounced back on that because I'm one of those, you know, go leave me alone in my room for a while type of people. Um, but I've known uh, a number of folks for whom that is a real coping mechanism. Just keep busy and eventually you're able to... Um, now, the one thing... Sometimes we focus on things like death where it's hard to go back to a normal. So let me change the example up a little bit. I want to change this uh, to some, a number of people, but not everyone have dealt with, but you've all known someone to deal with it. So let's chat about divorce. Because uh, let's chat about divorce. Because this is something, well, certainly the death of someone you love, you never go on. Divorce is something at one point or another, by and large, you have to, we well, don't have to, but you, most people decide to move on and try to find love again. Things like that. that would be there. What's that? I don't know who that would be. <laughs> I have no idea, Dave. I'm not looking at you. Well, I have now two spoke. But yeah. Point no fingers. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the example of because you're right, certain deaths and stuff you never move on. But one of the biggest, saddest things we can face is either either divorce or or like the end of a really close loving relationship. So at what point when a relationship fails? do you decide, okay, the sadness part is over, I'm going to try again? That That's a good question. Yeah, Dave, Dave well, you, seem to, right. you seem to have some, have some knowledge in this. Please share. I have to, with, with uh, experience, um, you feel like um, an empty feeling that your heart is broken, you know, in a divorce, yeah. and it's, uh, it's something that's going to be permanent, and it's it, you feel like you're a failure, mm -hmm. and it's hard to, uh, what went wrong, you try to analyze the things that you did wrong, you, it would have made it better, and then you think, well, maybe that wouldn't, maybe it just isn't me, maybe it's both, it, it takes two, you know, to, oh, yeah. to make a marriage, and uh, it's a lot different than somebody dying, because when you're dying, it's, somebody dies that you're close to, it's final. Mm -hmm. you know? You know that person, you're never going to see that person again, even though you grieve over it. But in a divorce, that person is still around, you know, and it's still, you have to, if you have children, you have to deal with that person. Oh, yeah. And uh, you just can't have the feeling of, a, I don't know, that you're a failure. You know, you failed at something. And it takes time to, uh, this doesn't happen overnight. Even people talk to you and, and Try to you know heal your pain and stuff, and it's still there. It takes a long time before you really get over it. Yeah, it is something that happens overnight. You gotta realize that your heart is broken, and it takes a lot to mend it back up again. You know, it's, we are made so that one minute we can be happy, and the next minute we're sad. Oh well, yeah. this happens oh, just like that in an instant. You know, so that's when this question gets. This is where the rubber really meets the road. Because you're right. You know, a divorce, a broken relationship. You can be sad for a long time, and all the but at what point, and this is a very personal question, I'll throw it, at what point do you say, okay, I am no longer going to sit here and grieve this old relationship, but rather, I am going to pursue a new one? And for many of us, that is a very real, practical question, and I'm kind of curious. Because when we talk about death of a loved one, you're right, moving on, there may not be a moving on, but in the end of a relationship, there is. There's a, and you, you can grieve the loss of that person, you can grieve the end of that marriage or that close relationship or the marriage you would hope would have happened, all that good stuff. How do you know you are over a time of grief and are ready to try again? Oh, I'm not going to let this one go. You Almost <laughs> all of you have been there on a very, if it is a divorce, it is a loving relationship that didn't quite pan out. At what point? Are you ready to try again? You realize you've lost the trust in him, mm -hmm. that he doesn't want you back. So I might as well move on to him and he doesn't love you back, the love is never there. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're, yes, so to a point you looked at the whole thing and said, okay, this is what went wrong and this is what. It's... 
I'm ready to try it again. How long did that take from I'm sad that it's over to let's give it another whirl? Well, just the divorce is just kind of weird. Yeah. So I'm just starting to mm -hmm. get back out again. Fair enough. Well, some people, they already have somebody in mind. So <laughs> <laughs> it isn't right. okay. it gets, they're sad. Yeah. yeah. No, the the honesty award goes to Dave on this, yes. <laughs> Some people already got something lined up on the side. I, I was just trying to, yes. I'm assuming that's the that. Yes, I agree. Um, putting yourself in the more difficult position of the one who didn't have the plan. You know what I mean? That you really got the loss. At what point, and how do you know you're ready to try again? Yeah, I mean, just ignoring Dave's, exactly, Dave. I agree, sometimes someone's already got the plan before the, yeah, but let's, let's go the harder route here. <laughs> you just have to end up uh, meeting the right person that you think that is better than what you have. So now, oh, so the thing, the, the great person comes around, you're like, yeah, maybe it's time to do it. So it, it's the opposite. In other words, some people sometimes... You know, sort of talk, oh, when you get yourself in a place where you're ready to move on, blah, 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 then you start looking again. Sometimes you just bump in the right person. Like, yep, I'm ready to move on. It's an accident. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that when, uh, oh, what was that movie when Harry met Sally? Yeah. Well, yeah. When Harry met Sally? a lot, but they were never a couple. You know, but the other couple. Um, the, uh, there was a, a friend of Sally's who was dating this married guy for years and years. Yeah. Okay. And she kept suffering over it. Oh, he's never going to live. All this stuff. And so she keeps thinking about it over and over again. And then she bumps into his friend. Mm -hmm. And then instantly moves on. So maybe Dave's got a point. In other words, maybe we don't sit back and think, oh, okay, now I'm ready to move on. Maybe it's more of a, hey, great. That's a good place to go. And no, I mean, that's, a, that's a real point that sometimes the circumstance can... It's not may not be always very internal. The circumstance comes up, and now we're ready to move on. Well, it depends upon whether you want to be alone or or you you miss having a partner. You know? Yeah. Some people just want to be alone. They're done with it. They you know they yeah. had enough of relationships. With it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After my three year relationship ended, I went and got a part time job to fill out my weekends. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's your busyness. That was my business. I don't, yeah, I had time to kill after that. Is it, is it busyness like stuffing though? Avoiding. Oh yeah, it's it's complete avoidance. My feelings always were that nothing else mattered. My job didn't matter. The children, the children matter. They're the most that matters, but if they need you, but other things, just People in general, I just didn't want to be around anybody, and I just wanted to be by myself. Like, and like, yeah. She said I, I would try to work, you know, just to keep my mind off of it, but it was still there. I mean, I would sit there and do my job, and I just sit there and cry, you know. It, it's, it's hard when you love somebody, and then they're all of a sudden, you know, it's over. So when were you ready to meet someone new? Because you did. See, I, I like this. I get the, I, I know the ending here, so. Yeah. Why so, did you decide to go to that dance or that? Yeah, when did you decide you were, or did it go the other way around? Did you bump into Janina and, oh, I'll, go, I'll come over this? Well, it happened that we met, uh, of course it was a bar, but I was with a singles group and uh, she was with her sister at the time. They, were, they happened to be the same place. And her sister was come over and asked me to dance, so then I danced with her and then I, she introduced me to Janina. And then, actually, I wasn't, you know, thinking about it or dating her or anything. But then her her brother-in-law came back and got me because they were going to leave and go to a different place. So then I, I went along, and then of course, Tamina and I were here we off. We were talking and stuff like that. But it just uh, <laughs> oh, got to need to say, yeah, sort of, kind of. She that. wasn't. She wasn't really ready to have any relationship at all. And I guess I was. So I, I more or less. Was the instigator. Well, it seemed like you're, uh, you said you were there with a singles group, or what's the story? Yeah. So, I mean, at some point you were ready to try something. Yes, I was. Very few people join singles groups saying, I'll never love again. And this is, uh, you know, this is a direct, uh, remember, Ryland, every time you touch that, you got to move the speed of a sloth. 
Remember that was the goal. Now, when you're touching that thing, you with every movement you make <laughs> is the speed of a sloth. We discussed that. That's when I was holding it. Uh, <laughs> oh, now we're getting technical. Well, you made that rule. You're not helping, Ginny. <laughs> <laughs> New rule, if you touch the creature from the, that moment, oh. you No, the rule before. Oh, yeah, if you're holding it, fine. All right, so, no, I, and I'm kind of curious about this. At some point, if you decide, you know what, I'm not going to grieve. I, I might grieve, but I'm not going to live in this grief. I'm going to find someone new. Most people joining singles groups are, are ready to at least try finding someone new. Well, I had the experience with single groups. That at my age, I was in my early 40s. And most of the women in the singles group had two or three young kids, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is something else that you have to think about too. Am I going to be able to accept, you know, somebody else's oh. children? And yeah. That's a big that's thing. Another. Yeah, his single group wasn't really, they weren't with each other to try to find a mate. They were just wanting to socialize again. Oh, so it's a get out of the house group. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. No, not all the girls. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. I tell you, they wanted a husband. You know, I don't take care know. of their kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, the point, and, and the reason I brought up that example is it, it, broken relations are a great example of. Oh, yeah, that she was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great example of, of, again, you may grieve something for a while, but it is a great example of getting to a point where you're like, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, I have to get out there and socialize. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop wallowing and I'm gonna get out and meet, either meet new people or meet someone new or something. There's that turning point. Yeah. And, and it just happens. Yeah. Happen to come along and they just say hi. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. And so, I mean. So there's a point that uh, something that really hurts you, you may never fully get over or anything like that. But there is a point where we're trying to live again, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And it's and that's my million dollar question for today. How do you know when you want to live again and not be sad? Or at least not be as sad. Or to do something different that changes the direction from being internal to going out and, and healing. What are you thinking? I never mentioned a million dollars in this. Your grandmother is the treasure of this church. And I, no, no, no. I said it was a million dollar question. That is an expression meaning it's a very important question. There's no actual million dollars there. Talk to your grandmother. She's the treasure of this church. We do not have a million dollars. I actually haven't checked though. Let me check. Oh, treasure. No. <laughs> She's a good treasure. Every time I ask her something, she says no. <laughs> Just check, no, there's no actual, literal million, it's a million dollar question. I know. Well, fair, no, no, it's a good question. Before we start writing checks around here, I want to be sure that this is, but, so there is a point, and my, my million dollar question for you, though there is no money involved. One dollar. I got a dollar. I think it's still a dollar, but, um, at what point do you know you have transitioned from needing to grieve to a point where something's moving on? When do you know that? When the first thing makes you happy again. Oh, that's a good one. Oh! That's a good one, that feeling. That, now, what do you mean by the feeling. first thing? Yeah. Well, you know, you're grieving and you're down in the dumps and suddenly something makes you happy again. Maybe it's seeing someone. Yeah. Maybe it's your favorite ice cream. You, you find something worth being happy about. And then you know it's time to go on. Life is worth living. With relationships, the first time I have a crush. Yeah. You know, have a crush or attraction to somebody. I may not ever pursue or date that person, but the first time I get a little crushy ink, inkling, I'm just like, okay, it's time to, to look again. So you're feeling some sort of happiness, yeah. even if it's simple like a good ice cream or something yeah. like that. Gina, you have a thought? I was thinking about Rylan and, and how he may really have experience, because when he had his broken bone, mm -hmm. he couldn't live again. 
Yeah, he's stuck. Yeah. And so there came a moment when he could live again. This is a fit, yeah, it's a physical metaphor. In other words, at some point, Rowling, when you broke your ankle, well, you guys do look alike. Can you just stay there for a second? But I have a question for you, Ryla. All right, church moments. I'm going to take a picture of him. Because obviously, him and the sloth will get... I'll have to mark these because they look alike. All right. One, two. Very nice. Okay, hand down so I can see the sloth. Very. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Oh, treasured moments forever. When I'm in a nursing home and I can't do anything else, I'll look at this picture and laugh. All right. Well, it's because I wasn't holding it. Yes, it didn't matter, you had to stay still for the picture. So it all works. He looks really Okay. I had a great <laughs> Um Ryla had to live again after breaking his arm. You were actually doing a physical yeah, so in other words, Ryla, and this is actually an odd little literal question, but I'm kinda of curious. Uh, you broke your ankle. Yeah. It hurt. Well, it wasn't my ankle. It was actually like my foot, so right up in this area up here. Please put your favorite foot right on the table so I can see that. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, so right up in there, you broke it. Yeah. I assume it hurt. Oh, really bad. I thought it was just because it landed funny, because normally I like jump off of stuff. Oh, all the time, yeah. Yeah, like, because I... With no fear about whether you hurt yourself. It's a harm, Gene. Keep going. Yeah, I get like hurt sometimes, and I just walk it off, mm -hmm. because... But then we were playing, and then I jumped off the slide, mm -hmm. and, I, and I just thought I was, I landed funny, so I tried getting up, but it, I couldn't. Oh, it wasn't, not. yeah, and you get that feeling, something ain't working right. Yeah, I was like, no. ah, this really hurts, right. and it really hurt, and I could not put, I could put some weight, but then it just hurt really too bad, I could When not did you know, in the weeks after that, when did you know you could put weight on again? Well, when I had my walking boot, I could put weight on it. Even though the doctor didn't say. My parents <laughs> no, said, no, probably the doctor said, don't put weight on it, but yeah. that's okay. <laughs> my parents said it's fine. Mm -hmm. All right. So you had a crutch. Oh, yeah, he had the whole setup. Walking I can remember boot, that. Yeah. yeah. I was, but yeah, it didn't hurt when I had the walking boot on, but then we tried taking it off for like. Okay. Like, so, yeah. Like, so at some point, you like, take it off and give it a try. A while later, but I still couldn't. And it was, I couldn't after then. I tried, but I could barely. I, I act like it, I was because I just wanted it off because it felt so good. Mm -hmm. Because all the stuff around my foot didn't feel good. No, no, so I, I just yeah. kind of fake stepped it. Like I put as much weight on it, that foot and then I just like, like kind of jumped up and mm -hmm. did like a... Uh, Type thing, but it hurt too much. Yeah. So you're giving it a try. So Can I put that's weight? a good yeah. idea too. Is yeah. That you don't, yeah, you're, you're right. tricking yourself. Yep. You gotta trick yourself. It may be very similar. I I, I don't know. This is, then, every once in a while you go in a weird direction. I'm not sure, but let's try it. Yeah. So there are times. When if I can, where you're like a broken, like a physical injury, you know, the most, you're just giving it a try. What's it gonna feel like if I go out with this single screw? Mm -hmm. What's it gonna feel like if I? It, yeah. it hurt really. What's it gonna feel like if I put weight on this foot right now? Oh, maybe not a good time. I I, I started so I I was like balancing on one foot. I put my foot down. It felt nice, but it was it felt so weird having the floor on my bare foot. Yeah, exactly. Because I had it in the boot. It felt like I was wearing a shoe. For yeah. Oh no, you so got. So it got really sensitive, and then her calf was also. Oh uh, yeah. Because I was also really using crutches. Now I assume at some point though, you took the boot off. Yeah. You put some weight on it, and it didn't feel so bad anymore. Is that correct, or did I get that wrong? Well, the first time I tried, I put I was like on one foot. I put my foot down, and I could put that much weight, then as soon as I started putting more and more and more, yeah. it hurt, so I just leaned back over. Yeah, that's one of those, oh no, not maybe not yet. I get <laughs> yeah, that. And then, yeah. like, and then later, when we were at the doctor, um, she said that it wasn't healed fully, so we, I had the boot longer, and then when I, when, when it was like close to done, we took it off and we tried. I can't remember it the best because it was a while ago, but pretty recent. At your age, things have to I understand. It's okay. But I, I was, I think we took the boot off and I was trying to walk and I actually could. So then the day, when it was like the last day, we brought my boot and stuff and I was, I think, yeah, I had, I had, 
I was walking there with, like they said that this day is the day that like you're done and then they kick. Then we walked there and and we got to keep the crutches and the boots, but I don't know why. But then well, it's so near. You'll need it later. <laughs> but no, this is it. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I was walking back with, like, what I'm, like, my shoes, what I'm wearing now, my socks. And we, I, we were walking back. I had socks on. And we, we went back, and I took my sock off. And I, they did the x ray, and it, it was fine. It, it had, it was, it was still a little, it was still a little broken, but it was healing really good, so they said that it's fine, and then, yeah, we pretty much mm -hmm. started actually walk. Now, if you only had x-rays for your own feelings, we know when we can step out again, but we'll, we'll deal with that later. Kind of like faking it until you feel it, or <laughs> trying until you feel it. The main answer I was thinking of, no one has mentioned yet, and I'm a little surprised. For me, I know I'm ready to move on when I'm angry at the original feeling. Meaning, I become, no, not so much like the bad relationship or whatever. It's, I am tired of being in the dumps because of what someone else did. In other words, I'm now angry. Not, and for a while, it's a set. It becomes anger to the point where it's, I don't want to live this way because of what someone else did. Or what, you know, and even, and so for me, actually, that yeah. getting angry about the fact that I'm here now because of that is the, for me that's the sign ding, 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 ding. you're ready to go to somewhere else you're ready to try again you're ready to yeah what are you thinking sir um but is it fine if i tell you like how i jumped off and how i was thinking well f define fine remember this is all recording so if you're you know the, i mean I what was, you're i was just like my friends uh, we we just got done with like a math lesson or whatever and so you got done with math and wanted to jump off the slider or not math. I've gotten out of math more than one time. And then we got finished with like the lesson. Mm -hmm. And then it was recess, so we went outside. It was a, we got outside a little bit earlier than the other class, but um, then we would put ice. We wanted to play tag because the boys when we go out there and play tag, and then like one girl joins, and then more girls are joining, and then it, yeah. I get you. And then, yeah. and then they go and Well, I heard it, the rumor was play. you were avoiding getting tagged when you jumped yeah, off a very tall slide. It was like. Because you know, a broken foot is better than getting four, tagged. Probably that's, like halfway to the roof. Yeah, okay. And then I, then I that's jumped what I got. Yeah. And then I jumped off, and. Because the tiger, oh, yeah, I that's said, a whole different story. Yeah, because I was like, right there, and then I jumped off. Harm <laughs> genetics, they do not know. <laughs> Certain, I'm sorry, I love you, Riley, but certain children would look at that height and say, it's not safe to jump off this. The harms do not have this instinct. I've seen it in Grandpa. I've high. seen it in your dad. And now I see it in you. The other kids were jumping, like, like kind of, the top is here, and then they were yeah. jumping like here. Yeah, they would stay up there. And they would go lower, but Well, you were the I only one that went to the very top and said, yeah, this will work. This was my first time doing it, though. Oh, I'm sure it was. And then last, I said, last. I said,
time you're. <laughs> that's a good thing. We can all jump. We can just jump. So you know, don't jump off the top of the slide here. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta crawl up there first. Gotta crawl up there first. Yeah, so. That's like, yeah. true. Because I remember being your age and having a distinct sense of fear about certain heights. This is why I did not break a bone until I was much older and I fell off a bicycle. Because I would have been the child halfway up saying, I don't know if this is so smart. But. I don't think. Yeah, I know I understand, and it's okay. The different That's children. My brain is but your brain does great things. You knew all no. about sloths. You're a very smart kid. Um, There's no, not all about. You knew a lot about them. Oh, I know they have more about them. Don't see. All right. Thoughts on? And like I said, this conversation took another left turn into God only knows where. But I really enjoyed it, so that's okay. Thoughts before we go on healing. Um, mostly emotional injuries, but maybe some physical injuries. How do you know? when you can move on. Last thoughts. Right, hold that thought. I'm going to talk about How do we know? I get angry. Cassie, I don't know. I don't know if you're... You just... You know it's there because something makes you laugh and you feel happy yeah. again. Yeah. How do you know when... You just decided at some point... Uh, I've had enough of that nonsense. Really right. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, fair enough. Hey. I've never had a real... Long-lasting relationship I've ever had. Dear God, did I use an example that you just completely don't... I mean, that, that honestly, that's a little... That's really quite remarkable, i got to say. I'm, I'm going to awe this for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, I have to have. Yeah. Uh, I've had a few others. Uh, I've had a few others that's divorced, and I have a sister that's divorced, yeah. and I have a brother that's divorced. When do they decide it's time to move on? My sister will never marry Mm -hmm. She probably takes it a little longer now than she likes to marry. Don't think my mother. Um, and my daughter's goes, I have two small children, no man's going to want this. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there were different attitudes with both of them. Okay. Um, both of them are the ones that instigated the divorce. Mm -hmm. So maybe that makes a difference? Yeah, I'm not sure if it does. I mean, I, to a point, I guess it might, but I, I think often even those who ask for the divorce are still hurting over a lack of relationship or something. Yeah. So that's why I kind of want to throw it out there. But I think... She, you know, well, they were both married to alcoholics. Yeah. Versus the
How's it going, Riley? Right? Coming down? <laughs> <laughs>